Good morning, everybody. Why don't you guys stand and we'll worship together.
my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds his hands his feet my Savior on that cursed tree Just 
pray together. Father, we come before you this morning. God, just sing songs just like that. God, we know it's not Easter. We know that this song is made for Easter. 
and a picture, a picture of you on the cross dying for us. And Father, we know that we can sing the song whenever we want. It doesn't have to be a certain time of season that comes. We know that you designed this song, you created this song so we could sing it all year long and that we could constantly be reminded that you died for us. And God, that we could see the ultimate sacrifice, the ultimate example of love. And Father, we just pray that you would just be with all of us right now. It might have, it might have been hard to get here. It might have been really easy to get here. But God, we're here. And it's not by accident. And Father, I just pray that you would open our eyes to you today. That we would see you for who you are in all of your glory. And Father, we love you so much. In your name we pray. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts. As we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. guys here's how it works yesterday the ladies at their conference had 65 women so it's come down to this if you if you love your pastor men you will sign up if you don't love your pastor you won't sign up it's just that simple we, we need you there. It's, it's something we do once a year. It's, it's, it's being a member of this church. You want to get involved in the special things we do. Guys, all we're going to do is talk about prayer, eat, and talk to one another. It's real simple. It doesn't cost anything. You can come part of the night. If you just come Friday, come part of the night. Come part of Saturday. Uh, please sign up, men, and uh, learn about prayer. I promise you, if you come, God will bless you in a special way. Today is Communion Sunday, and we've really, the messages have all been communion-oriented. If you're new at this communion thing, you need to understand communion wasn't meant to just be a religious ceremony where we come and we, we eat a cracker and drink some juice and we do our religious duty. Communion is supposed to deal with your heart. That when we remember what Jesus did by dying on that cross, it puts remorse in our heart for our sin. It makes us confess our sin. We should be so thankful for what Jesus did. And today we're going to look at the cross. Um, I'm not going to look at all of it. I'm going to break it down in two sermons. Um, today we're going to look at the mercy at the cross. And the next time we'll look at the miracles at the cross. And it is just a fascinating thing. If you've never seen the miracles at the cross, do not miss these messages. So we're going to read today. I want to read the passage. It's so important. Uh, the scripture is what deals with our heart and our minds. Um, so if you have a Bible and you like to read in it, we're going to be Mark 15, verses 16 through 32. Maybe you, maybe you like to look at the verses on your iPhone with the ringer turned off, okay? Or just... Follow along with us up here. It says, And the soldiers led him away inside the palace, that is the governor's headquarters, 
they called together the whole battalion. And they clothed him in a purple cloak. And twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on him. And they began to salute him. Hail, King of the Jews. And they were striking his head with a reed and spitting on him. And kneeling down in homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him, and they led him out to crucify him. And they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. And they brought him to the place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his garments among them, casting lots for them to decide what each should take. And it was the third hour when they crucified him. And the inscription of the charge against him read, The king of the Jews. And with him they crucified two robbers, one on his right, one on his left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. And so also the chief priests with the scribes mocked him to one another, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. And those who were crucified with him also reviled him. Now you might say, Frank, you titled this Mercy at the Cross. I don't see any mercy there. I see nothing but mockery and pain for Jesus. But you have to understand the mercy is implied because if there was ever a time for God to get mad, if there was ever a time for God to send his wrath, it would have been now. And God has sent wrath before and he will send it again. In Genesis 6, the scripture says God's heart was filled with pain. He was grieved that he created man because of the sin and he destroyed the world with a flood, but there was grace he gave to Noah's family because he would see you and he would see me, people that he chose to save. God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. He rained fire down on their, their wickedness. And yet here, his son is being mocked and ridiculed beyond beyond ridicule, beyond, it's just flat out evil. But Isaiah, first part of Isaiah 53.10 says, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. It was God's will to crush Jesus. The wrath did not hit the people crucifying Jesus, mocking Jesus. The wrath hit Jesus, for the sake of our sins. Notice, number one, notice the mercy on the mockers. And the soldiers led him away inside the palace, that is the governor's headquarters, and they called together the whole battalion. Could have been up to 600 soldiers some of them most likely on duty, but the rest of them, all these soldiers came together to mock Jesus, and they clothed him in, pur in a purple cloak. Purple was the sign of royalty. The kings, the royal people wore these purple scarlet cloaks and twisted together a crown of thorns, and they put it on him. And they began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews. Uh, that, this King of the Jews title that we keep seeing, this was a way to mock Jesus. This, this wasn't a compliment. 
They were mocking him by, by calling him the king of the Jews. In the other gospels, the religious leaders were upset that there was a sign that said king of the Jews. Pilate basically told him, shut up. It is what I want it to be. I want that sign on him. And it was done as a mockery. And they were striking his head with a reed and spitting on him and kneeling down in homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak, put on his clothes, probably a loincloth, and led him out to crucify him. So they're mocking him as a king. You know, Jesus is already beaten up pretty bad. Um, when we left, the, the last verse that we left on said that Jesus was scourged and then he was sentenced to be crucified. And Mark just says he was scourged, but it doesn't really tell us, it doesn't give us a description of what that scourging was. And this scourging was brutal, and sometimes the scourging would actually, men would die from the scourging before they would get to the cross. It was a whip, and they had, it had chunks of bone and metal in it, and it was designed that when the whip hit your back, it would pull off your flesh, and sometimes it would expose organs. So Jesus, is, his back is already bloodied. He's, he's lost a lot of blood. They've already beaten him in the head, and now they pound they literally pound the crown of thorns into his skull. And if you know anything about head wounds, how much it bleeds, he was literally covered in blood before the cross. And they mocked him. And they stripped him of that purple cloak. And I want to tell you, when they, when they grabbed that, that cloak off of him, it was like a huge Band-Aid on his back. And so this was, this was mocking, this was suffering beyond our imagination. Um, it, it is interesting to me when you read the Gospels and you read uh, about the crucifixion of Jesus, it, it doesn't go into these details of the physical pain. We know the details because we can study history, and we know what history tells us what they did to somebody crucified but the gospels don't they just say he was flogged here mark says he was crucified and it seems that the that the holy spirit is more focused on the mocking and the mania of what people did to god versus the physical pain Letting us know, listen, the mocking and the mania that was done to Jesus Christ is worse than the physical pain that he went through. But I will tell you, um, do you know, you know the word excruciating? If you've ever used that word, excruciate, it, it's a Latin word means to crucify. And it was in, excruciating pain for Jesus. But Jesus as I said, had mercy on these mockers. He told Peter, listen, I could, call down, I could call down a legion of angels at any time. And yet he allowed them to do this to him. They spit on God. You know how degrading spitting on someone is? We all don't like it. You know, you watch an NFL game, these guys are all hitting each other, tackling each other. They got dirt all over their face. They got sweat all over their face. But man, when somebody spits in another player's face, we're like, suspend that guy. Because why? It's so degrading. It's so disgusting to do that. These people spit in the face of God who was dying for their sins. God had mercy. God is a God of mercy. Number two, there's a little bit of good news in this passage is we see mercy on a missionary. Mercy on a missionary. And it says, and they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country. 
the father of Alexander and Rufus to carry his cross. Now, Mark's gospel was written years later after these events. And Mark, we know, was writing to the church in Rome. He's just given the headlines. And Mark, as he's writing, whoever this man was that they forced to carry the cross, Mark tells the people in Rome, you know his name. He's Simon of Cyrene. That would be, that's North Africa, that's modern-day Libya. And he says, you would know him because he's the father of Alexander and Rufus. Who are these guys? They're people in the church. They're people in the church. We don't know for sure, but we think it's possible that Simon of Cyrene not only helped carry the cross of Jesus, but he believed in Jesus and became a missionary, and they started a church. Acts 11 tells us there were a bunch of men from Cyrene who was teaching people about Jesus. Something happened in that place called Cyrene, and some people think it had something to do with Simon. And I'll tell you what, Simon helped carry Jesus' cross, and I'm going to tell you, you don't give, when you give Jesus some real help, he's going to help you back. And it might be that Simon became a believer, but he know, we know that his children did. Romans 16, 13 says, as Paul is closing and he's thanking people in the ministry, and he says, greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and also his mother. That would be Simon's wife, who has been a mother to me as well. And how many people in the world do we know named Rufus, right? <laughs> I'm thinking that's, that's Simon's son. And it seems that God did a great work of mercy on this man that they forced to carry the cross. And then thirdly and finally, let's, let's notice the mercy. I'll call this mercy on the maniac so I can make all my points match. Mercy on the maniacs. And it says, and they brought him to the place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull. We don't know for sure why it's called place of the skull. I was reading about this. Some think it's because uh, David possibly buried Goliath's head there that he cut off. Because he took it to Jerusalem. Some think, people think that. Some think of just, it's a place of a skull because there was a lot of death there. A lot of death. Uh, some believe it's the place of the skull because it, th this big giant rock that was there actually looks like a skull. And I'll be honest with you, when I went to Israel and I saw it, it does resemble a skull. When you can see it from all the buses, there's a bus station right there in Israel blowing smoke on it, but... It was a place of death, a place where they crucified criminals, and they took our Savior there. Verse 23, and they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. They offered him painkillers. This wine mixed with myrrh was like a, a painkiller, and you know, you, you think maybe they're having a little bit of mercy, but these, these Romans really didn't have a lot of mercy. Sometimes it would just be maybe for their benefit because when he's about to get railroad spikes put through his wrist and through his feet, it would make a criminal calm down a little bit for them to do it so they could get this over with and get them to suffer and to die. The reason why Jesus refused it is because Jesus had to take the full weight of sin and he was not going to dull his senses. And, and once again, here's one more thing to be thankful for. Jesus refused the painkillers so we would in eternity never experience pain again. That's something to be thankful for when you read that. 
it says, and they crucified him and divided his garments among them, casting lots for them to decide what each should take. So they're just, they're just mocking him. They're playing games over who's going to get whatever remainder clothes that he had. And I just, and I see again, Mark says they, they crucified him. That's it. And folks, you got to understand, crucifixion was designed to make people suffer. I mean, you literally, you literally would drown in the air. And, and the, you know, they would cross your feet, put that spike in. Your, 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 your bones would be dislocated from hanging there. You would dislocate your, your shoulders as you would pull up and push down on your feet. You'd have to, to take a breath. And sooner or later, out of exhaustion, you can't take a breath, and it would kill you. So it was, it was excruciating, again, using the word to crucify, pain that Jesus went through. It says, and it was the third hour when they crucified him. That would be 9 a.m. He hung on the cross from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. And the, ins the inscription of the charge against him read, the king of the Jews, mockery. And with him, they crucified two robbers, one on his right and one on his left. Two criminals. Remember, we talked about it. Barabbas was probably meant to be in that center cross. But Jesus took his place. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. So here comes passers-by. Well, how are people passing by? Because this is what they did. They, this is what the Romans did. They crucify you by a main road. So as you're coming and going, you'd see people dying on a cross, and it was the Romans' way of saying, don't mess with Rome or you'll be up there. But people could come by, and people could, could talk with these criminals. And so these guys wagging their heads, shaking their head in, in mockery, disgust. And that whole, that whole thing, you will destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, they twisted that. Jesus was talking about his body. He, he was basically saying, when you, destroy, when you put me on that cross in three days, I'm going to rise up. And they, they twisted it that he was going to do something to the temple. Verse 30, they say, save yourself and come down from the cross. And so also the chief priests with the scribes mocked him to one another, saying he saved others, but he cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down from the cross that we may see and believe. If Christ would have came down from the cross, there would be no salvation. And no one could believe. And, and he did not save himself because he was saving others. And those who were crucified with him also reviled him. So you, you got the criminals now down next to him, and they're, they're mocking him as well. And God does nothing because... Jesus was taking our place. Listen to Psalm 22. I would encourage you to go and read the whole psalm. Yeah, I'll give you a little excerpt of it. It's, uh, th this psalm is so amazing. This psalm was written hundreds of years before crucifixion was ever invented. It was invented by the Persians and the Romans perfected it. Hundreds of years. Listen to what it says. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. There was a, there's a doctor that did an account of the crucifixion. And the proof of what he said is he said Jesus' heart literally exploded. 
And that's why when they came to Jesus and it was prophecy, his, his, you know, his joints were dislocated, but no bone would be broken. It's amazing none of his bones were broken because if that fulfilled prophecy. And when they came to Jesus, they would always break their legs. When they claimed to Jesus, he was already dead. So the soldier put the spear in his heart. And what came out? Water gushed out. Blood and water. Because his heart exploded, fulfilling this prophecy. He says, my strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. For dogs encompass me, and many of evildoers encircle me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing, they cast lots. How in the world was that written hundreds of years before crucifixion was even invented? And it's describing the exact crucifixion that Jesus went through. I'll tell you why. The Bible is true. The Bible is true. It's the word of God. Only God would know this. Only God could write this and make these prophecies come true. So before we take communion, let's talk about some mercy and realize the mercy that's upon us. After all this, after all that they said to Jesus, after, they, after all that they did to Jesus, Luke's gospel said, Jesus said this, Verse 34, Luke 23, and Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He prayed for the people that were mocking him, spitting on him. Father, forgive them. They don't, they don't realize really what they're doing. Have mercy upon them. And so Jesus was dying so that prayer could be answered and their sins could be forgiven. Even the people that were murdering God can be forgiven. Is there any sin that can't be forgiven? No. The only sin that can't be forgiven is the sin of rejecting Christ because then you're stuck in all your sins if you reject Christ. But if you come to Christ and ask for mercy, every sin can be forgiven. And some of the good news we know as we read in other gospels and as we read, we'll read later on, one of the Roman soldiers that was in charge of this crucifixion, he said, truly, this was the Son of God. And the Roman soldier gave his heart to Christ. God had mercy on that soldier that was a part of the crucifixion. And what about those criminals? What about those criminals that are mocking Jesus? Luke 23 says, and one of the criminals who were hanged railed at him saying, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. And the other rebuked him saying, Do you not fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said to Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. There's the grace of God. Because Mark tells us this criminal was mocking Jesus at first. But something happened. He saw the words of Jesus. He saw the beauty of Jesus. He saw the innocence of Jesus. And his heart was touched. And he asked for mercy. Did this criminal, never did anything religious, never went to church, was dying for his sins? And Jesus said, today, you'll be with me in heaven. You will be with me in heaven. How awesome is that? And the other criminal who rejected him went from that pain of dying on a cross to eternal pain for all 
for all of eternity because he refused to humble himself and embrace the love of Jesus Christ. Folks, that's just, that's how it works. You ask for mercy, you get it. You're too pride, you don't need mercy, then you don't get it. It's just how it works. Here's some good news too, Acts 6. You know, I'm, I'm tough on the religious leaders. I've been, you know, you just don't like them. They're self-righteous. They're against Jesus. And you always think they're bad. And they were bad. And the majority of them are in hell today. We're awaiting the final hell today, put it that way. But they're not happy where they're at, I promise you. But listen to Acts 6, 7 says, And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly into Jerusalem. This is after the resurrection now. And a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Wow, these priests that were behind murdering Jesus, that were making up these lies, that were mocking him, came to Christ. And they became obedient to the faith. That is the grace of God. And so there's nothing. I'll close with this. I was listening to a sermon by John MacArthur. And he was talking about how he went, was invited to speak at Louisiana State Prison, uh, Angola, it's called. And it's, uh, it's a very, it's a prison that has, you know, career criminals in it. And they asked MacArthur to go. And, and MacArthur spoke at the, at the highest risk security part of the prison. And when MacArthur went there, he knew that he was going to be, most of them were in there for murder. And so MacArthur knew as he was wanting to present the gospel to them and for them to come to Christ, he used this story of the cross and he used it to tell them that, listen, even the people that murdered God found grace and could be forgiven. Uh, the warden took MacArthur aside and he said, I don't know if you noticed, but he said, the guy that was sitting in the middle had his eyes fixed on you with like, you know, like tears in his eyes fixed on your message. And he said, that is the number one hitman of Pablo Escobar, of the Colombian drug lord. And he said, just recently at a Bible study, he prayed and asked Christ to be his savior. But he desperately, he, the warden said, he desperately needed to hear that. That message was just for him so he would know that even somebody that committed murder could be forgiven because the cross of Jesus Christ. <coughs> now, there are people in our world, if they heard that story, some of you know about that grace, but there are self-righteous people in the world, if they heard that story, they'd say, you mean to tell me that that number one Hitman of the Colombian drug lord is going to be in heaven because he put his faith in Christ. And me, a good person, a wonderful person that doesn't come to Christ, is not going to be in heaven? <laughs> Anybody that says that is a narcissist. And that's why they're going to be in hell. Because they see themselves as so good and so self-righteous and so better than others that they don't need the mercy of Jesus Christ. They don't believe the words of Jesus when Jesus said, listen, if you call somebody a fool, you call somebody an idiot, you've committed murder in your heart. You have a murderous heart and you need salvation. This is how it works, dear friends. You humble yourself and you ask Jesus Christ for mercy and he will forgive your sins. Or you're going to go to the judgment and you're going to get a fair trial. 
And God's going to show you every thought, every word, every deed, every motive of your heart. And you're going to find out the good person you really were. And there'll be no forgiveness for you. Scripture says our righteous acts are like filthy rags to God. It's garbage to him. It sickens him. But what his precious son did to him pleases him. And if you look at the beauty of Jesus Christ and the beauty of the cross and the beauty of Jesus willingly to lay his life down, and you come to that and you honor God and glorify God for what he did for you and you ask for mercy, you're going to be in heaven for all of eternity. Every day, every day saying, I don't deserve this, but praise God I have it. Praise God I have it. As we take communion now, we're going to pass the emblems. Hold on to the emblems. If you're new here, just hold on to them. I'll come out and say a few things, and we'll pray together and take it together as a church body. But, but uh, let's remember. Let's remember what Jesus did. When you read this, does it, does it move your heart at all? Are you sorry for your sin? Maybe you walked in here today and you, ne you never asked God for mercy. You can do that. I walked into a church when I was a teenager in the back row and I asked God for mercy and he gave it to me. He gave it to me. He'll give it to you. All you got to do like this criminal did, Jesus, forgive me of my sin. You've done nothing wrong, but I've done, I've done a lot wrong and I deserve this. Please forgive my sin. Come into my life. And the Lord will. Let's bow in prayer, pray together. And then our men will pass out these emblems. And I pray in this moment that you'd have real communion before you even get the emblems. I pray that your heart would be saddened by your sin. And I don't know, if your heart's hard, you might have to pray, God, please soften my heart. It's so hard, God. Ask God to do it. You can't fix your own heart. Only God can. And I hope you're thankful. I hope you realize the magnitude of this, of what Jesus went through. Folks, listen, anybody that, that could hear what Jesus did for them and reject it and stay self-righteous and act like they're a good person and they don't need it, I'm going to tell you right now, they don't deserve to be in heaven. It's just the truth. But if you humble yourself today, and I, and I know believers in here, let's be thankful. Let's, let's don't take communion lightly. Let's don't like get it over with. Let's be thankful in this moment. We got a whole week ahead of us. We give God, we give God an hour on Sunday morning. And Jesus gave everything for us. I think we can not hurry through it. We can worship. We can confess our sin. We can be so grateful and then we can sing to God, which God loves that as well. He loves it when we sing to him. Father, thank you for your grace. It is, it is amazing grace, Father. Your mercy, your mercies are new every single day. God, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry that this world doesn't see your beauty. I'm sorry more people don't ask for your beautiful mercy thank you God that a few of us here we have it you've given us mercy you've given us grace that we don't deserve thank you that your cross is powerful enough to forgive any sin thank you for what you did Jesus Thank you for going through all this mockery and pain on my behalf. Lord, help us, God. We're committed for as long as we live.
to tell people about your great mercy and to lift you up and glorify you. I pray that you're pleased with us today, Lord. I pray that you receive our prayers. And God, thank you for your love. Put your arms around people here that are hurting and need a touch from you. Bring that lost person. Soften that hardened heart. Help them to see clearly your gospel. In Jesus' name, amen. we take the bread because Jesus said to the disciples you know this is my body and I don't even know if the disciples fully understood what was about to happen and so when we take this bread what we read today what we talked about the crucifixion that his body would would take wear that crown of thorns and take those spikes in his wrists and his feet remember his body that he gave for you let's take that together and then of course the bl- the juice represents his blood Jesus was so bloody his back his head wearing that crown of thorns and of course the spikes It was a very bloody, bloody cross. The scripture says God purchased the church with his blood. It's his blood, his death. Blood symbolizes it's his death that satisfies God's judgment and wrath that would be upon us. But Jesus took our place. So we remember that. Let's take together.
Father, thank you. We can't thank you enough. God, for all of eternity, we'll never be able to thank you enough. But God, we do want you to receive glory. We love you. We want to love you back the best we can because you first loved us. I pray, Father, that now we'd sing a song and worship you. And I pray, God, that we'd leave church and go out and remember you all week long. And God, we would grow in your goodness. We thank you for all these things in Jesus' name.
Man, if you love me, sign up. Men's conference. I'll be seeing you Friday. Um, Revelation. Revelation. Uh, this week we're in chapter 14. We're getting some good news. It's telling us God is pleading with the world, even as he's sent in his wrath. He's pleading with the world to turn to him. It's, it's good stuff. Love to have you come. Bring your kids to Awana. And as we close, I want to pray for Marjorie Garrett, okay? Her husband, Neil, some of you know this, he's battling a disease that has absolutely taken over his mind. He's in a nursing home. He, he fell this morning. I don't know how serious it is, but she called and asked that we pray. So we're going to pray for her. Marjorie's been battling health problems, and she's been through a real lot, okay? You know, if you, when you're ever you're having a bad day, you think you're having a bad day, think of what some of these other people are going through and pray for them. It'll help you get through your day. And think about what Jesus went through for you. It'll, it'll help stop your complaining, okay? But let's pray, and it will be dismissed. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for these precious words of Scripture. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we pray for Marjorie. God, she's been going through so much, battling health problems of her own and, and trying to take care of her husband that she loves so much, battling this disease. God, I pray you'd be with her at the hospital now. We pray that you'd be with Neil, God, a, a man who loved you and served you. We pray that you'd help him get through this, help him not to suffer, God, much longer. I pray that you'd take him to heaven, Lord. I pray that you'd take him to heaven. Father, I pray for Marjorie. I pray that uh, you bring healing to her body as well and give her strength to get through this. We thank you that you answer prayer. Thank you for what us men are going to learn at this conference about prayer and, and how important prayer is, what it is, and how to pray. We thank you that you hear us, God. In Jesus' name, amen. See you next time. Wednesday, Friday for sure, man. Yeah. <laughs>